Chapter Twelve of the Story of My Life. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of My Life by Helen Keller. Chapter Twelve. After my first visit to Boston, I spent almost every winter in the North. Once I went on a visit to a New England village with its frozen lakes and vast snowfields. It was then that I had opportunities such as had never been mine to enter into the treasures of the snow. I recall my surprise on discovering that a mysterious hand had stripped the trees and bushes, leaving only here and there a wrinkled leaf. The birds had flown, and their empty nests in the bare trees were filled with snow. Winter was on hill and field. The earth seemed benumbed by his icy touch, and the very spirits of the trees had withdrawn to their roots, and there, curled up in the dark, lay fast asleep. All life seemed to have ebbed away, and even when the sun shone the day was shrunk and cold, as if her veins were sapless and old, and she rose up decrepitly for a last dim look at earth and sea. The withered grass and the bushes were transformed into a forest of icicles. Then came a day when the chill air portended a snowstorm. We rushed out of doors to feel the first few tiny flakes descending. Hour by hour the flakes dropped silently, softly from their airy height to the earth, and the country became more and more level. A snowy night closed upon the world, and in the morning one could scarcely recognize the feature of the landscape. All the roads were hidden, not a single landmark was visible, only a waste of snow with trees rising out of it. In the evening a wind from the northeast sprang up, and the flakes rushed hither and thither in furious melee. Around the great fire we sat and told merry tales, and frolicked, and quite forgot that we were in the midst of a desolate solitude, shut in from all communication with the outside world. But during the night the fury of the wind increased to such a degree that it thrilled us with a vague terror. The rafters creaked and strained, and the branches of the trees surrounding the house rattled and beat against the windows, as the winds rioted up and down the country. On the third day after the beginning of the storm the snow ceased. The sun broke through the clouds and shone upon a vast undulating white plain. High mounds, pyramids heaped in fantastic shapes, and impenetrable drifts lay scattered in every direction. Narrow paths were shoveled through the drifts. I put on my cloak and hood and went out. The air stung my cheeks like fire. Half walking in the paths, half working our way through the lesser drifts, we succeeded in reaching a pine grove just outside a broad pasture. The trees stood motionless and white like figures in the marble frieze. There was no odor of pine needles. The rays of the sun fell upon the trees, so that the twigs sparkled like diamonds and dropped in showers when we touched them. So dazzling was the light, it penetrated even the darkness that veils my eyes. As the days wore on, the drifts gradually shrunk, but before they were wholly gone another storm came, so that I scarcely felt the earth under my feet once all winter. At intervals the trees lost their icy covering, and the bulrushes and underbrush were bare, but the lake lay frozen and hard beneath the sun. Our favorite amusement during that winter was tobogganing. In places the shore of the lake rises abruptly from the water's edge. Down these steep slopes we used to coast. We would get on our toboggan, a boy would give us a shove, and off we went. Plunging through drifts, leaping hollows, swooping down upon the lake, we would shoot across its gleaming surface to the opposite bank. What joy! What exhilarating madness! For one wild glad moment we snapped the chain that binds us to earth, and joining hands with the winds we felt ourselves divine. End of chapter 12《of the story of my life》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Story of My Life》by Helen Keller Chapter 13 
It was in the spring of 1890 that I learned to speak. The impulse to utter audible sounds had always been strong within me. I used to make noises, keeping one hand on my throat while the other hand felt the movements of my lips. I was pleased with anything that made a noise and liked to feel the cat purr and the dog bark. I also liked to keep my hand on a singer's throat or on a piano when it was being played. Before I lost my sight and hearing, I was fast learning to talk, but after my illness, it was found that I had ceased to speak because I could not hear. I used to sit in my mother's lap all day long and keep my hands on her face because it amused me to feel the motions of her lips. And I moved my lips too, although I had forgotten what talking was. My friends say that I laughed and cried naturally, and for a while I made many sounds and word elements. Not because they were a means of communication, but because the need of exercising my vocal organs was imperative. There was, however, one word that meaning of which I still remembered: water. I pronounced it wawa. Even this became less and less intelligible until the time when Miss Sullivan began to teach me. I stopped using it only after I had learned to spell the word on my fingers. I had known for a long time that the people about me used a method of communication different from mine, and even before I knew that a deaf child could be taught to speak, I was conscious of dissatisfaction with the means of communication I already possessed. One who is entirely dependent upon the manual alphabet has always a sense of restraint, of narrowness. This feeling began to agitate me with a vexing, forward-reaching sense of a lack that should be filled. My thoughts would often rise and beat up like birds against the wind, and I persisted in using my lips and voice. Friends tried to discourage this tendency, fearing lest it should lead to disappointment, but I persisted, and an accident soon occurred which resulted in the breaking down of this great barrier. I heard the story of Ragnhild Carter, Mrs. Lamson, who had been one of Laura Bridgman's teachers. And who had just returned from a visit to Norway and Sweden came to see me and told me of Ragnhild Carter, a deaf and blind girl in Norway who had actually been taught to speak. Mrs. Lamson had scarcely finished telling me about this girl's success before I was on fire with eagerness. I resolved that I too would learn to speak. I would not rest satisfied until my teacher took me for advice and assistance to Miss Sarah Fuller. Principal of the Horace Mann School, this lovely, sweet-natured lady offered to teach me herself, and we began the twenty-sixth of March, eighteen ninety. Miss Fuller's method was this: she passed my hand lightly over her face and let me feel the position of her tongue and lips when she made a sound. I was eager to imitate every motion, and in an hour had learned six elements of speech: M, P, A, S, T. I, Miss Fuller gave me eleven lessons in all. I shall never forget the surprise and delight I felt when I uttered my first connected sentence. It is warm. True, they were broken and stammering syllables, but they were human speech. My soul, conscious of new strength, came out of bondage and was reaching through those broken symbols of speech to all knowledge and all faith. No deaf child who has earnestly tried to speak the words which he has never heard to come out of the prison of silence, where no tone of love, no song of bird, no strain of music ever pierces the stillness, can forget the thrill of surprise, the joy of discovery which came over him when he uttered his first word. Only such a one can appreciate the eagerness with which I talk to my toys, to stones, trees, birds, and dumb animals, or the delight I felt when, at my call, Mildred ran to me, or my dogs obeyed my commands. It is an unspeakable boon to me to be able to speak in winged words that need no interpretation. As I talked, happy thoughts fluttered up out of my words that might perhaps have struggled in vain to escape my fingers. But it must not be supposed that I could really talk in this short time. I had learned only the elements of speech. Miss Fuller and Miss Sullivan could understand me, but most people would not have understood one word in a hundred. 
nor is it true that after I had learned these elements I did the rest of the work myself. But for Miss Sullivan's genius, untiring perseverance and devotion, I could not have progressed as far as I have toward natural speech. In the first place, I labored night and day before I could be understood even by my most intimate friends. In the second place, I needed Miss Sullivan's assistance constantly in my efforts to articulate each sound clearly and to combine all sounds in a thousand ways. Even now she calls my attention every day to mispronounced words. All teachers of the deaf know what this means, and only they can at all appreciate the peculiar difficulties with which I had to contend. I had to use the sense of touch in catching the vibrations of the throat, the movements of the mouth, and the expression of the face. And often this sense was at fault. In such cases I was forced to repeat the words or sentences, sometimes for hours, until I felt the proper ring in my own voice. My work was practice, practice, practice. Discouragement and weariness cast me down frequently. But the next moment the thought that I should soon be at home and show my loved ones what I had accomplished spurred me on, and I eagerly looked forward to their pleasure in my achievement. My little sister will understand me now was a thought stronger than all obstacles. I used to repeat ecstatically, I am not dumb now. I could not be despondent while I anticipated the delight of talking to my mother and reading her responses from her lips. It astonished me to find how much easier it is to talk than to spell with the fingers, and I discarded the manual alphabet as a medium of communication on my part. But Miss Sullivan and a few friends still use it in speaking to me, for it is more convenient and more rapid than lip-reading. Just here, perhaps, I had better explain our use of the manual alphabet, which seems to puzzle people who do not know us. One who reads or talks to me spells with his hand, using the single-hand manual alphabet generally employed by the deaf. I place my hand on the hand of the speaker so lightly as not to impede its movements. The position of the hand is as easy to feel as it is to see. I do not feel each letter any more than you see each letter separately when you read. Constant practice makes the fingers very flexible, and some of my friends spell rapidly, about as fast as an expert writes on a typewriter. The mere spelling is, of course, no more a conscious act than it is in writing. When I had made speech my own, I could not wait to go home. At last the happiest of happy moments arrived. I had made my homeward journey, talking constantly to Miss Sullivan, not for the sake of talking, but determined to improve to the last minute. Almost before I knew it, the train stopped at the Tuscumbia station, and there on the platform stood the whole family. My eyes fill with tears now as I think how my mother pressed me close to her, speechless and trembling with delight, taking in every syllable that I spoke, while little Mildred seized my free hand and kissed it and danced, and my father expressed his pride and affection in a big silence. It was as if Isaiah's prophecy had been fulfilled in me. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. End of chapter 13、Chapter、14 of the Story of My Life This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of My Life by Helen Keller Chapter 14 the winter of 1892 was darkened by the one cloud in my childhood's bright sky. Joy deserted my heart, and for a long, long time I lived in doubt, anxiety, and fear. Books lost their charm for me, and even now the thought of those dreadful days chills my heart. A little story called The Frost King, which I wrote and sent to Mr. Anagnos of the Perkins Institution for the Blind, was at the root of the trouble. In order to make the matter clear, I must set forth the facts connected with this episode, which justice to my teacher and to myself compels me to relate. I wrote the story when I was at home, the autumn after I had learned to speak. 
we had stayed up at Fern Quarry later than usual. While we were there, Miss Sullivan had described to me the beauties of the late foliage, and it seems that her descriptions revived the memory of a story which must have been read to me, and which I must have unconsciously retained. I thought then that I was making up a story, as children say, and I eagerly sat down to write it before the ideas should slip from me. My thoughts flowed easily. I felt a sense of joy in the composition. Words and images came tripping to my finger ends, and as I thought out sentence after sentence, I wrote them on my braille slate. Now, if words and images come to me without effort, it is a pretty sure sign that they are not the offspring of my own mind, but stray waifs that I regretfully dismiss. At that time I eagerly absorbed everything I read without the thought of authorship, and even now I cannot be quite sure of the boundary line between my ideas and those I find in books. I suppose that is because so many of my impressions come to me through the medium of others' eyes and ears. When the story was finished, I read it to my teacher, and I recall now vividly the pleasure I felt in the more beautiful passages, and my annoyance at being interrupted to have the pronunciation of a word corrected. At dinner it was read to the assembled family, who were surprised that I could write so well. Someone asked me if I had read it in a book. This question surprised me very much for I had not the faintest recollection of having had it read to me. I spoke up and said, Oh no, it is my story, and I have written it for Mr. Anagnos. Accordingly, I copied the story and sent it to him for his birthday. It was suggested that I should change the title from Autumn Leaves to The Frost King, which I did. I carried the little story to the post office myself, feeling as if I were walking on air. I little dreamed how cruelly I should pay for that birthday gift. Mr. Anagnus was delighted with the Frost King, and published it in one of the Perkins Institution reports. This was the pinnacle of my happiness, from which I was in a little while dashed to earth. I had been in Boston only a short time when it was discovered that a story similar to The Frost King, called The Frost Fairies, by Miss Margaret T. Canby, had appeared before I was born in a book called Birdie and His Friends. The two stories were so much alike in thought and language that it was evident Miss Canby's story had been read to me, and that mine was a plagiarism. It was difficult to make me understand this, but when I did understand, I was astonished and grieved. No child ever drank deeper of the cup of bitterness than I did. I had disgraced myself, I had brought suspicion upon those I loved best, and yet how could it possibly have happened? I racked my brain until I was weary to recall anything about the frost that I had read before I wrote The Frost King, but I could remember nothing except the common reference to Jack Frost and a poem for children, The Freaks of the Frost and I knew I had not used that in my composition. At first Mr. Anagnus, though deeply troubled, seemed to believe me. He was unusually tender and kind to me, and for a brief space the shadow lifted. To please him I tried not to be unhappy, and to make myself as pretty as possible for the celebration of Washington's birthday, which took place very soon after I received the sad news. I was to be serious in the kind of mask given by the blind girls. How well I remember the graceful draperies that enfolded me, the bright autumn leaves that wreathed my head, and the fruit and grain at my feet and in my hands, and beneath all the gaiety of the mask the oppressive sense of coming ill that made my heart heavy. The night before the celebration, one of the teachers of the institution had asked me a question connected with the Frost King, and I was telling her that Miss Sullivan had talked to me about Jack Frost and his wonderful works. Something I said made her think she detected in my words a confession that I did remember Miss Camby's story of the Frost Fairies, and she laid her conclusions before Mr. Anagnus, although I had told her most emphatically that she was mistaken. 
Mr. Anagnus, who loved me tenderly, thinking that he had been deceived, turned a deaf ear to the pleadings of love and innocence. He believed, or at least suspected, that Miss Sullivan and I had deliberately stolen the bright thoughts of another, and imposed them on him to win his admiration. I was brought before a court of investigation composed of the teachers and officers of the institution, and Miss Sullivan was asked to leave me. Then I was questioned and cross-questioned with what seemed to me a determination on the part of my judges to force me to acknowledge that I remembered having had the Frost Fairies read to me. I felt in every question the doubt and the suspicion that was in their minds, and I felt too that a loved friend was looking at me reproachfully, although I could not have put all this into words. The blood pressed about my thumping heart, and I could scarcely speak, except in monosyllables. Even the consciousness that it was only a dreadful mistake did not lessen my suffering, and when at last I was allowed to leave the room, I was dazed and did not notice my teacher's caresses, or the tender words of my friends, who said I was a brave little girl, and they were proud of me. As I lay in my bed that night, I wept as I hope few children have wept. I felt so cold, I imagined I should die before morning, and the thought comforted me. I think if this sorrow had come to me when I was older, it would have broken my spirit beyond repairing. But the angel of forgetfulness has gathered up and carried away much of the misery and all the bitterness of those sad days. Miss Sullivan had never heard of the Frost Fairies or of the book in which it was published. With the assistance of Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, she investigated the matter carefully, and at last it came out that Mrs. Sophia C. Hopkins had a copy of Miss Camby's Birdie and His Friends in 1888, the year that we spent the summer with her at Brewster. Mrs. Hopkins was unable to find her copy, but she has told me that at that time, while Miss Sullivan was away on a vacation, she tried to amuse me by reading from various books, and although she could not remember reading The Frost Fairies any more than I, yet she felt sure that Birdie and his friends was one of them. She explained the disappearance of the book by the fact that she had a short time before sold her house and disposed of many juvenile books, such as old school books and fairy tales, and that Birdie and his friends was probably among them. The stories had little or no meaning for me then, but the mere spelling of the strange words was sufficient to amuse a little child who could do almost nothing to amuse herself, and although I do not recall a single circumstance connected with the reading of the stories, yet I cannot help thinking that I made a great effort to remember the words, with the intention of having my teacher explain them when she returned. One thing is certain. The language was ineffaceably stamped upon my brain, though for a long time no one knew it, least of all myself. When Miss Sullivan came back, I did not speak to her about the Frost Fairies, probably because she began at once to read Little Lord Fauntleroy which filled my mind to the exclusion of everything else. But the fact remains that Miss Camby's story was read to me once, and that long after I had forgotten it, it came back to me so naturally that I never suspected that it was the child of another mind. In my trouble I received many messages of love and sympathy. All the friends I loved best, except one, have remained my own to the present time. Miss Camby herself wrote kindly, Some day you will write a great story out of your own head that will be a comfort and help to many. But this kind prophecy has never been fulfilled. I have never played with words again for the mere pleasure of the game. Indeed, I have ever since been tortured by the fear that what I write is not my own. For a long time, when I wrote a letter, even to my mother, I was seized with a sudden feeling of terror, and I would spell the sentences over and over to make sure that I had not read them in a book. Had it not been for the persistent encouragement of Miss Sullivan, I think I should have given up trying to write altogether. I have read The Frost Fairies since, also the letters I wrote in which I used other ideas of Miss Camby's. 
I find in one of them a letter to Mr. Anagnos, dated September the 29th, 1891, words and sentiments exactly like those of the book. At the time I was writing The Frost King, and this letter, like many others, contains phrases which show that my mind was saturated with the story. I represent my teacher as saying to me of the golden autumn leaves, Yes, they are beautiful enough to comfort us for the flight of summer. An idea direct from Miss Camby's story. This habit of assimilating what pleased me and giving it out again as my own appears in much of my early correspondence and my first attempts at writing. In a composition which I wrote about the old cities of Greece and Italy, I borrowed my glowing descriptions with variations from sources I have forgotten. I knew Mr. Anagnus' great love of antiquity and his enthusiastic appreciation of all beautiful sentiments about Italy and Greece. I therefore gathered from all the books I read every bit of poetry or of history that I thought would give him pleasure. Mr. Anagnos, in speaking of my composition on the cities, has said, These ideas are poetic in their essence. But I do not understand how he ever thought a blind and deaf child of eleven could have invented them. Yet I cannot think that, because I did not originate the ideas, my little composition is therefore quite devoid of interest. It shows me that I could express my appreciation of beautiful and poetic ideas in clear and animated language. Those early compositions were mental gymnastics. I was learning, as all young and experienced persons learn, by assimilation and imitation, to put ideas into words. Everything I found in books that pleased me, I retained in my memory, consciously or unconsciously, and adapted it. The young writer, as Stevenson had said, instinctively tries to copy whatever seems most admirable, and he shifts his admiration with astonishing versatility. It is only after years of this sort of practice that even great men have learned to marshal the legion of words which come thronging through every byway of the mind. I am afraid I have not yet completed this process. It is certain that I cannot always distinguish my own thoughts from those I read, because what I read become the very substance and texture of my mind. Consequently, in nearly all that I write, I produce something which very much resembles the crazy patchwork I used to make when I first learned to sew. This patchwork was made of all sorts of odds and ends, pretty bits of silk and velvet. But the coarse pieces that were not pleasant to touch always predominated. Likewise, my compositions are made up of crude notions of my own, inlaid with the brighter thoughts and riper opinions of the authors I have read. It seems to me that the greater difficulty of writing is to make the language of the educated mind express our confused ideas, half feelings, half thoughts, when we are little more than bundles of instinctive tendencies. Trying to write is very much like trying to put a Chinese puzzle together. We have a pattern in mind which we wish to work out in words, but the words will not fit the spaces, or if they do, they will not match the design. But we keep on trying because we know that others have succeeded, and we are not willing to acknowledge defeat. There is no way to become original except to be born so, said Stevenson, and although I may not be original, I hope sometime to outgrow my artificial, periwigged compositions. Then, perhaps, my own thoughts and experiences will come to the surface. Meanwhile, I trust and hope and persevere, and try not to let the bitter memory of the Frost King trammel my efforts. So this sad experience may have done me good and set me thinking on some of the problems of composition. My only regret is that it resulted in the loss of one of my dearest friends, Mr. Anagnos. Since the publication of the story of my life in the Ladies' Home Journal, Mr. Anagnus has made a statement, in a letter to Mr. Macy, that at the time of the Frost King matter he believed I was innocent. He says, the court of investigation before which I was brought consisted of eight people, four blind, four seeing persons. Four of them, he says, thought I knew that Miss Camby's story had been read to me, and the others did not hold this view. 
Mr. Anagnus states that he cast his vote with those who were favourable to me. But however the case may have been, with whichever side he may have cast his vote, when I went into the room where Mr. Anagnus had so often held me on his knee, and, forgetting his many cares, had shared in my frolics, and found there persons who seemed to doubt me, I felt that there was something hostile and menacing in the very atmosphere, and subsequent events have borne out this impression. For two years he seems to have held the belief that Miss Sullivan and I were innocent. Then he evidently retracted his favourable judgment. Why, I do not know. Nor did I know the details of the investigation. I never knew even the names of the members of the court who did not speak to me. I was too excited to notice anything, too frightened to ask questions. Indeed, I could scarcely think what I was saying, or what was being said to me. I have given this account of the Frost King affair because it was important in my life and education, and in order that there might be no misunderstandings, I have set forth all the facts as they appear to me, without the thought of defending myself or of laying blame on anyone. End of chapter 14「Of the Story of My Life」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of My Life by Helen Keller Chapter 15 The summer and winter following the Frost King incident I spent with my family in Alabama. I recall with delight that home-going. Everything had budded and blossomed. I was happy. The Frost King was forgotten. When the ground was strewn with the crimson and golden leaves of autumn, and the musk-scented grapes that covered the arbor at the end of the garden were turning golden-brown in the sunshine, I began to write a sketch of my life, a year after I had written The Frost King. I was still excessively scrupulous about everything I wrote. The thought that what I wrote might not be absolutely my own tormented me. No one knew of these fears except my teacher. A strange sensitiveness prevented me from referring to the Frost King, and often when an idea flashed out in the course of conversation I would spell softly to her, I am not sure it is mine. At other times, in the midst of a paragraph I was writing, I said to myself, Suppose it should be found that all this was written by someone long ago? An impish fear clutched my hand, so that I could not write any more that day. And even now I sometimes feel the same uneasiness and disquietude. Miss Sullivan consoled and helped me in every way she could think of, but the terrible experience I had passed through left a lasting impression on my mind, the significance of which I am only just beginning to understand. It was with the hope of restoring my self-confidence that she persuaded me to write for the youth's companion a brief account of my life. I was then twelve years old. As I look back on my struggle to write that little story, it seems to me that I must have had a prophetic vision of the good that would come of the undertaking, or I should surely have failed. I wrote timidly, fearfully, but resolutely, urged on by my teacher, who knew that if I persevered I should find my mental foothold again and get a grip on my faculties. Up to the time of the Frost King episode, I had lived the unconscious life of a little child. Now my thoughts were turned inward, and I beheld things invisible. Gradually I emerged from the penumbra of that experience with a mind made clearer by trial and with a truer knowledge of life. The chief events of the year 1893 were my trip to Washington during the inauguration of President Cleveland, and visits to Niagara and the World Fair. Under such circumstances my studies were constantly interrupted, and often put aside for many weeks, so that it is impossible for me to give a connected account of them. We went to Niagara in March 1893. It is difficult to describe my emotions when I stood on the point which overhangs the American Falls and felt the air vibrate and the earth tremble. It seems strange to many people that I should be impressed by the wonders and beauties of Niagara. They are always asking, 
What does this beauty or that music mean to you? You cannot see the waves rolling up the beach or hear their roar. What do they mean to you? In the most evident sense, they mean everything. I cannot fathom or define their meaning any more than I can fathom or define love or religion or goodness. During the summer of 1893, Miss Sullivan and I visited the World's Fair with Dr. Alexander Graham Bell. I recall with unmixed delight those days when a thousand childish fancies became beautiful realities. Every day, in imagination, I made a trip round the world, and I saw many wonders from the uttermost parts of the earth, marvels of invention, treasuries of industry and skill, and all the activities of human life actually passed under my fingertips. I like to visit the Midway Pleasance. It seemed like the Arabian Nights. It was crammed so full of novelty and interest. Here was the India of my books in the curious bazaar with its shivas and elephant gods. There was the land of the pyramids concentrated in the model Cairo with its mosques and its long processions of camels. Yonder were the lagoons of Venice, where we sailed every evening when the city and the fountains were illuminated. I also went on board a Viking ship which lay a short distance from the little craft. I had been on a man-of-war before, in Boston, and it interested me to see, on this Viking ship, how the seaman was once all in all, how he sailed and took storm and calm alike with undaunted heart, and gave chase to whosoever re-echoed his cry, We are of the sea, and fought with brains and sinews, self-reliant, self-sufficient, instead of being thrust into the background by an intelligent machinery as Jack is today. So it always is. Man only is interesting to man. At a little distance from this ship there was a model of the Santa Maria, which I also examined. The captain showed me Columbus' cabin and the desk with an hourglass on it. This small instrument impressed me most because it made me think how weary the heroic navigator must have felt as he saw the sand dropping grain by grain while desperate men were plotting against his life. Mr. Higginbotham, president of the World's Fair, kindly gave me permission to touch the exhibits, and with an eagerness as insatiable as that with which Pissarro sees the treasures of Peru, I took in the glories of the fair with my fingers. It was a sort of tangible kaleidoscope, this white city of the West. Everything fascinated me, especially the French bronzes. They were so lifelike, I thought they were angel visions which the artist had caught and bound in earthly forms. At the Cape of Good Hope exhibit, I learned much about the processes of mining diamonds. Whenever it was possible, I touched the machinery while it was in motion, so as to get a clearer idea how the stones were weighed, cut, and polished. I searched in the washings for a diamond and found it myself, the only true diamond, they said, that was ever found in the United States. Dr. Bell went everywhere with us, and in his own delightful way described to me the objects of greatest interest. In the electrical building we examined the telephones, autophones, phonographs, and other inventions, and he made me understand how it is possible to send a message on wires that mock space and outrun time, and, like Prometheus, to draw fire from the sky. We also visited the anthropological department, and I was much interested in the relics of ancient Mexico, in the rude stone implements that are so often the only record of an age, the simple monuments of nature's unlettered children, so I thought as I fingered them, that seem bound to last while the memorials of kings and sages crumble in dust away, and in the Egyptian mummies which I shrank from touching. From these relics I learned more about the progress of man than I have heard or read since. All these experiences added a great many new terms to my vocabulary, and in the three weeks I spent at the fair I took a long leap from the little child's interest in fairy tales and toys to the appreciation of the real and the earnest in the workaday world. End of chapter 15
16 of the story of my life. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of My Life by Helen Keller Chapter 16 Before October 1893, I had studied various subjects by myself in a more or less desultory manner. I read the histories of Greece, Rome, and the United States. I had a French grammar in raised print, and, as I already knew some French, I often amused myself by composing in my head short exercises, using the new words as I came across them, and ignoring rules and other technicalities as much as possible. I even tried, without aid, to master the French pronunciation, as I found all the letters and sounds described in the book. Of course, this was tasking slender powers for great ends, but it gave me something to do on a rainy day, and I acquired a sufficient knowledge of French to read with pleasure La Fontaine's fables, Le Médecin Malgré Lui, and passages from Attali. I also gave considerable time to the improvement of my speech. I read aloud to Miss Sullivan, and recited passages from my favorite poets, which I had committed to memory. She corrected my pronunciation, and helped me to phrase and inflect. It was not, however, until October 1893, after I had recovered from the fatigue and excitement of my visit to the World's Fair, that I began to have lessons in special subjects at fixed hours. Miss Sullivan and I were at that time in Halton, Pennsylvania, visiting the family of Mr. William Wade. Mr. Irons, a neighbor of theirs, was a good Latin scholar. It was arranged that I should study under him. I remember him as a man of rare, sweet nature, and of wide experience. He taught me Latin grammar principally, but he often helped me in arithmetic, which I found as troublesome as it was uninteresting. Mr. Irons also read with me Tennyson's In Memoriam. I had read many books before, but never from a critical point of view. I learned for the first time to know an author, to recognize his style as I recognize the clasp of a friend's hand. At first I was rather unwilling to study Latin grammar. It seemed absurd to waste time analyzing every word I came across, noun, genitive, singular, feminine, when its meaning was quite plain. I thought I might just as well describe my pet in order to know it. Order, vertebrate. Division, quadruped. Class, mammalia. Genus, felinus. Species, cat. Individual, tabby. But as I got deeper into the subject, I became more interested, and the beauty of the language delighted me. I often amused myself by reading Latin passages, picking up words I understood, and trying to make sense. I have never ceased to enjoy this pastime. There is nothing more beautiful, I think, than the evanescent fleeting images and sentiments presented by a language one is just becoming familiar with, ideas that flit across the mental sky, shaped and tinted by capricious fancy. Miss Sullivan sat beside me at my lessons, spelling into my hand whatever Mr. Irons said, and looking up new words for me. I was just beginning to read Caesar's Gallic War when I went to my home in Alabama. End of chapter 16、chapter、seventeen of the story of my life This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of My Life by Helen Keller Chapter 17 In the summer of 1894, I attended the meeting at Chautauqua of the American Association to promote the teaching of speech to the deaf. There it was arranged that I should go to the Wright Hummerson School for the Deaf in New York City. I went there in October 1894, accompanied by Miss Sullivan. This school was chosen especially for the purpose of obtaining the highest advantages in vocal culture and training in lip-reading. In addition to my work in these subjects, I studied, during the two years I was in the school, arithmetic, physical geography, French, and German. Miss Remy, my German teacher, could use the manual alphabet, and after I had acquired a small vocabulary, we talked together in German whenever we had a chance 
and in a few months I could understand almost everything she said. Before the end of the first year I read Wilhelm Tell with the greatest delight. Indeed, I think I made more progress in German than in any of my other studies. I found French much more difficult. I studied it with Madame Olivier, a French lady who did not know the manual alphabet and who was obliged to give her instruction orally. I could not read her lips easily, so my progress was much slower than in German. I managed, however, to read Le Médecin Malgré Lui again. It was very amusing, but I did not like it nearly so well as Wilhelm Tell. My progress in lip-reading and speech was not what my teachers and I had hoped and expected it would be. It was my ambition to speak like other people, and my teachers believed that this could be accomplished. But although we worked hard and faithfully, yet we did not quite reach our goal. I suppose we aimed too high, and disappointment was therefore inevitable. I still regarded arithmetic as a system of pitfalls. I hung about the dangerous frontier of guess, avoiding with infinite trouble to myself and others the broad valley of reason. When I was not guessing, I was jumping at conclusions, and this fault, in addition to my dullness, aggravated my difficulties more than was right or necessary. But although these disappointments caused me great depression at times, I pursued my other studies with unflagging interest, especially physical geography. It was a joy to learn the secrets of nature, how, in the picturesque language of the Old Testament, the winds are made to blow from the four corners of the heavens, how the vapours ascend from the ends of the earth, how rivers are cut out among the rocks, and mountains overturned by the roots, and in what ways man may overcome many forces mightier than himself. The two years in New York were happy ones, and I look back to them with genuine pleasure. I remember especially the walks we all took together every day in Central Park, the only part of the city that was congenial to me. I never lost a jot of my delight in this great park. I loved to have it described every time I entered it, for it was beautiful in all its aspects, and these aspects were so many that it was beautiful in a different way each day of the nine months I spent in New York. In the spring we made excursions to various places of interest. We sailed on the Hudson River and wandered about on its green banks, of which Bryant loved to sing. I liked the simple, wild grandeur of the Palisades. Among the places I visited were West Point, Tarrytown, the home of Washington Irving, where I walked through Sleepy Hollow. The teachers at the Wright Hammerson School were always planning how they might give the pupils every advantage that those who here enjoy, how they might make much of few tendencies and passive memories in the cases of the little ones, and lead them out of the cramping circumstances in which their lives were set. Before I left New York, these bright days were darkened by the greatest sorrow that I have ever borne, except the death of my father. Mr. John P. Spaulding of Boston died in February 1896. Only those who knew and loved him best can understand what his friendship meant to me. He who made everyone happy in a beautiful and obtrusive way was most kind and tender to Miss Sullivan and me. So long as we felt his loving presence and knew that he took a watchful interest in our work, fraught with so many difficulties, we could not be discouraged. His going away left a vacancy in our lives that has never been filled. End of chapter 17eighteen of the story of my life. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of My Life by Helen Keller. Chapter eighteen. In October eighteen ninety six I entered the Cambridge School of Young Ladies to be prepared for Radcliffe. When I was a little girl I visited Wellesley and surprised my friends by the announcement Some day I shall go to college, but I shall go to Harvard. When asked why I would not go to Wellesley, I replied that there were only girls there. 
the thought of going to college took root in my heart and became an earnest desire which impelled me to enter into competition for a degree with seeing and hearing girls in the face of the strong opposition of many true and wise friends when i left new york the idea had become a fixed purpose and it was decided that i should go to cambridge this was the nearest approach I could get to Harvard and to the fulfillment of my childish declaration. At the Cambridge School the plan was to have Miss Sullivan attend the classes with me and interpret to me the instruction given. Of course my instructions had had no experience in teaching any but normal pupils, and my only means of conversing with them was reading their lips. My studies for the first year were English history, English literature, German, Latin, arithmetic, Latin composition, and occasional themes. Until then, I had never taken a course of study with the idea of preparing for college. But I have been well drilled in English by Miss Sullivan, and it soon became evident to my teachers that I needed no special instruction in this subject beyond the critical study of the books prescribed by the college. I had had, moreover, a good start in French, and received six months' instruction in Latin, but German was the subject with which I was most familiar. In spite, however, of these advantages, there were serious drawbacks to my progress. Miss Sullivan could not spell out in my hand all that the books required, and it was very difficult to have textbooks embossed in time to be of use to me, although my friends in London and Philadelphia were willing to hasten the work. For a while, indeed, I had to copy my Latin in Braille, so that I could recite with the other girls. My instructors soon became sufficiently familiar with my imperfect speech to answer my questions readily and correct mistakes. I could not make notes in class or write exercises, but I wrote all my compositions and translations at home on my typewriter. Each day Miss Sullivan went to the classes with me and spelled into my hand with infinite patience all that the teacher had said. In study hours she had to look up new words for me and read and reread notes and books I did not have in raised print. The tedium of that work is hard to conceive. Frau Gröte, my German teacher, and Mr. Gilman, the principal, were the only teachers in the school who learned the finger alphabet to give me instruction. No one realized more fully than dear Frau Gröte how slow and inadequate her spelling was. Nevertheless, in the goodness of her heart, she laboriously spelt out her instructions to me in special lessons twice a week to give Miss Sullivan a little rest. But though everybody was kind and ready to help us, there was only one hand that could turn drudgery into pleasure. That year I finished arithmetic, reviewed my Latin grammar, and read three chapters of Caesar's Gallic War. In German I read, partly with my fingers and partly with Miss Sullivan's assistance, Schiller's Lied von der Glocke and Taucher, Heiner's Harzreise. Freitag's Aus dem Staat Friedlichs des Grossen, Riel's Fluch der Schönheit, Lessing's Minne von Barnhelm, and Goethe's Aus meinem Leben. I took the greatest delight in these German books, especially Schiller's wonderful lyrics, the history of Frederick the Great's magnificent achievements, and the account of Goethe's life. I was sorry to finish Die Herzreise, so full of happy witticisms and charming descriptions of vine-clad hills, streams that sing and ripple in the sunshine, and wild regions, sacred to tradition and legend, the grey sisters of a long-vanished imaginative age, descriptions such as can be given only by those to whom nature is a feeling, a love, and an appetite. Mr. Gilman instructed me part of the year in English literature. We read together, As You Like It, Burke's Speech and Conciliation with America, and Macaulay's Life of Samuel Johnson. Mr. Gilman's broad views of history and literature and his clever explanations made my work easier and pleasanter than it could have been had I only read notes mechanically with the necessarily brief explanations given in the classes. Burke's speech was more instructive than any other book on a political subject that I had ever read. 
my mind stirred with the stirring times, and the characters round which the life of two contending nations centred seemed to move right before me. I wondered more and more while Burke's masterly speech rolled on in mighty surges of eloquence, how it was that King George and his ministers could have turned a deaf ear to his warning prophecy of our victory and their humiliation. Then I entered into the melancholy details of the relation in which the great statesman stood to his party and to the representatives of the people. I thought how strange it was that such precious seeds of truth and wisdom should have fallen among the tares of ignorance and corruption. In a different way, Macaulay's Life of Samuel Johnson was interesting. My heart went out to the lonely man who ate the bread of affliction in Grub Street, and yet in the midst of toil and cruel suffering of body and soul always had a kind word and lent a helping hand to the poor and despised. I rejoiced over all his successes, I shut my eyes to his faults, and wondered, not that he had them, but that they had not crushed or dwarfed his soul. But in spite of Macaulay's brilliancy and his admirable faculty of making the commonplace seem fresh and picturesque, his positiveness wearied me at times, and his frequent sacrifices of truth to effect kept me in a questioning attitude very unlike the attitude of reverence in which I had listened to the Demosthenes of Great Britain. At the Cambridge School, for the first time in my life, I enjoyed the companionship of seeing and hearing girls of my own age. I lived with several others in one of the pleasant houses connected with the school, the house where Mr. Howells used to live, and we all had the advantage of home life. I joined them in many of their games, even blind man's buff and frolics in the snow. I took long walks with them. We discussed our studies and read aloud the things that interested us. Some of the girls learned to speak to me, so that Miss Sullivan did not have to repeat their conversation. At Christmas my mother and little sister spent the holidays with me, and Mr. Gilman kindly offered to let Mildred study in his school. So Mildred stayed with me in Cambridge, and for six happy months we were hardly ever apart. It makes me most happy to remember the hours we spent helping each other in study and sharing our recreation together. I took my preliminary examination for Radcliffe from the 29th of June to the 3rd of July in 1897. The subjects I offered were elementary and advanced German, French, Latin, English, and Greek and Roman history, making nine hours in all. I passed in everything, and received honors in German and English. Perhaps an explanation of the method that was in use when I took my examinations will not be amiss here. The student was required to pass in sixteen hours, twelve hours being called elementary, and four advanced. He had to pass five hours at a time to have them counted. The examination papers were given out at nine o'clock at Harvard and brought to Radcliffe by a special messenger. Each candidate was known, not by his name, but by a number. I was number 233, but as I had to use a typewriter, my identity could not be concealed. It was thought advisable for me to have my examinations in the room by myself, because the noise of the typewriter might disturb the other girls. Mr. Gilman read all the papers to me by means of the manual alphabet. A man was placed on guard at the door to prevent interruption. The first day I had German, Mr. Gilman sat beside me and read the paper through first, then sentence by sentence, while I repeated the words aloud to make sure that I understood him perfectly. The papers were difficult and I felt very anxious as I wrote out my answers on the typewriter. Mr. Gilman spelled to me what I had written, and I made such changes as I thought necessary, and he inserted them. I wish to say here that I have not had this advantage since in any of my examinations. At Radcliffe no one reads the papers to me after they are written, and I have no opportunity to correct errors unless I finish before the time is up. In that case, I correct only such mistakes as I can recall in the few minutes allowed, and make notes of these corrections at the end of my paper. If I passed with higher credit in the preliminaries than in the finals, there are two reasons. 
In the finals, no one read my work over to me, and in the preliminaries, I offered subjects with some of which I was in a measure familiar before my work in the Cambridge School. For at the beginning of the year, I had passed examinations in English, history, French, and German, which Mr. Gilman gave me from previous Harvard papers. Mr. Gilman sent my written work to the examiners with a certificate that I, candidate number 233, had written the papers. All the other preliminary examinations were conducted in the same manner. None of them was so difficult as the first. I remember that the day Latin paper was brought to us, Professor Schilling came in and informed me I had passed satisfactorily in German. This encouraged me greatly, and I sped on to the end of the ordeal with a light heart and a steady hand. End of chapter 18《of the story of my life》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Story of My Life》by Helen Keller Chapter 19 When I began my second year at the Gilman School, I was full of hope and determination to succeed. But during the first few weeks I was confronted with unforeseen difficulties. Mr. Gilman had agreed that that year I should study mathematics principally. I had physics, algebra, geometry, astronomy, Greek, and Latin. Unfortunately, many of the books I needed had not been embossed in time for me to begin with the classes, and I lacked important apparatus for some of my studies. The classes I was in were very large, and it was impossible for the teachers to give me special instruction. Miss Sullivan was obliged to read all the books to me, and interpret for the instructors, and for the first time in eleven years it seemed as if her dear hand would not be equal to the task. It was necessary for me to write algebra and geometry in class and solve problems in physics, and this I could not do until we bought a braille writer by means of which I could put down the steps and processes of my work. I could not follow with my eyes the geometrical figures drawn on the blackboard, and my only means of getting a clear idea of them was to make them on a cushion with straight and curved wires which had bent and pointed ends. I had to carry in my mind, as Mr. Keith says in his report, the lettering of the figures, the hypothesis and conclusion, the construction and the process of the proof. In a word, every study had its obstacles. Sometimes I lost all courage and betrayed my feelings in a way I am ashamed to remember, especially as the signs of my trouble were afterward used against Miss Sullivan, the only person of all the kind friends I had there who could make the crooked straight and the rough places smooth. Little by little, however, my difficulties began to disappear. The embossed books and other apparatus arrived, and I threw myself into the work with renewed confidence. Algebra and geometry were the only studies that continued to defy my efforts to comprehend them. As I have said before, I had no aptitude for mathematics. The different points were not explained to me as fully as I wished. The geometrical diagrams were particularly vexing, because I could not see the relation of the different parts to one another, even on the cushion. It was not until Mr. Keith taught me that I had a clear idea of mathematics. I was beginning to overcome these difficulties when an event occurred which changed everything. Just before the books came, Mr. Gilman had begun to remonstrate with Miss Sullivan on the ground that I was working too hard, and in spite of my earnest protestations, he reduced the number of my recitations. At the beginning, we had agreed that I should, if necessary, take five years to prepare for college. But at the end of the first year, the success of my examinations showed Miss Sullivan, Miss Harbo, Mr. Gilman's head teacher, and one other, that I could, without too much effort, complete my preparation in two years more. Mr. Gilman at first agreed to this, but when my tasks had become somewhat perplexing, he insisted that I was overworked and that I should remain at his school three years longer. I did not like his plan, for I wished to enter college with my class. On the 17th of November I was not very well, and did not go to school. 
Although Miss Sullivan knew that my indisposition was not serious, yet Mr. Gilman, on hearing of it, declared that I was breaking down and made changes in my studies which would have rendered it impossible for me to take my final examinations with my class. In the end, the difference of opinion between Mr. Gilman and Miss Sullivan resulted in my mother's withdrawing my sister Mildred and me from the Cambridge school. After some delay, it was arranged that I should continue my studies under a tutor, Mr. Merton S. Keith of Cambridge. Miss Sullivan and I spent the rest of the winter with our friends, the Chamberlains, in Wrentham, twenty-five miles from Boston. From February to July 1898, Mr. Keith came out to Wrentham twice a week and taught me algebra, geometry, Greek, and Latin. Miss Sullivan interpreted his instruction. In October 1898, we returned to Boston. For eight months, Mr. Keith gave me lessons five times a week, in periods of about an hour. He explained each time what I did not understand in the previous lesson, assigned new work, and took home with him the Greek exercises which I had written during the week on my typewriter, corrected them fully, and returned them to me. In this way, my preparation for college went on without interruption. I found it much easier and pleasanter to be taught by myself than to receive instruction in class. There was no hurry, no confusion. My tutor had plenty of time to explain what I did not understand, so I got on faster and did better work than I ever did in school. I still found more difficulty in mastering problems in mathematics than I did in any other of my studies. I wish algebra and geometry had been half as easy as the languages and literature. But even mathematics Mr. Keith made interesting. He succeeded in whittling problems small enough to get through my brain. He kept my mind alert and eager, and trained it to reason clearly, and to seek conclusions calmly and logically, instead of jumping wildly into space and arriving nowhere. He was always gentle and forbearing, no matter how dull I might be, and believe me, my stupidity would often have exhausted the patience of Job. On the 29th and 30th of June, 1899, I took my final examinations for Radcliffe College. The first day I had elementary Greek and advanced Latin, and the second day geometry, algebra, and advanced Greek. The college authorities did not allow Miss Sullivan to read the examination papers to me, so Mr. Eugene C. Vining, one of the instructors at the Perkins Institution for the Blind, was employed to copy the papers for me in American Braille. Mr. Vining was a stranger to me, and could not communicate with me except by writing Braille. The proctor was also a stranger, and did not attempt to communicate with me in any way. The Braille worked well enough in the languages, but when it came to geometry and algebra, difficulties rose. I was sorely perplexed and felt discouraged wasting much precious time, especially in algebra. It is true that I was familiar with all literary braille in common use in this country, English, American, and New York Point, but the various signs and symbols in geometry and algebra in the three systems are very different, and I had used only the English braille in my algebra. Two days before the examinations, Mr. Vining sent me a braille copy of one of the old Harvard papers in algebra. To my dismay, I found that it was in the American notation. I sat down immediately and wrote to Mr. Vining, asking him to explain the signs. I received another paper and a table of signs by return mail, and I set to work to learn the notation. But on the night before the algebra examination, while I was struggling over some very complicated examples, I could not tell the combinations of bracket, brace, and radical. Both Mr. Keith and I were distressed and full of forebodings for the morrow, but we went over to the college a little before the examination began, and had Mr. Vining explain more fully the American symbols. In geometry, my chief difficulty was that I had always been accustomed to read the propositions in line print, or to have them spelled into my hand, and somehow, although the propositions were right before me, I found the braille confusing, and could not fix clearly in mind what I was reading. But when I took up algebra, I had a harder time still. 
the signs which I had so lately learned, and which I thought I knew, perplexed me. Besides, I could not see what I wrote on my typewriter. I had always done my work in Braille or in my head. Mr. Keith had relied too much on my ability to solve problems mentally, and had not trained me to write examination papers. Consequently, my work was painfully slow, and I had to read the examples over and over before I could form any idea of what I was required to do. Indeed, I am not sure now that I read all the signs correctly. I found it very hard to keep my wits about me. But I do not blame anyone. The administrative board of Radcliffe did not realize how difficult they were making my examinations, nor did they understand the peculiar difficulties I had to surmount. But if they unintentionally placed obstacles in my way, I have the consolation of knowing that I overcame them all. End of chapter 19 The Story of My Life This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of My Life by Helen Keller Chapter 20 The struggle for admission to college was ended, and I could now enter Radcliffe whenever I pleased. Before I entered college, however, it was thought best that I should study another year under Mr. Keith. It was not, therefore, until the fall of 1900 that my dream of going to college was realized. I remember my first day at Radcliffe. It was a day full of interest for me. I had looked forward to it for years. A potent force within me, stronger than the persuasion of my friends, stronger even than the pleadings of my heart, had impelled me to try my strength by the standards of those who see and hear. I knew that there were obstacles in the way, but I was eager to overcome them. I had taken to heart the words of the wise Roman who said, To be banished from Rome is but to live outside of Rome. Debarred from the great highways of knowledge, I was compelled to make the journey across country by unfrequented roads. That was all. And I knew that in college there were many bypaths where I could touch hands with girls who were thinking, loving, and struggling like me. I began my studies with eagerness. Before me I saw a new world opening in beauty and light, and I felt within me the capacity to know all things. In the wonderland of mind I should be as free as another. Its people, scenery, manners, joys, tragedies, should be living, tangible interpreters of the real world. The lecture halls seemed filled with the spirit of the great and the wise, and I thought the professors were the embodiment of wisdom. If I have since learned differently, I am not going to tell anybody. But I soon discovered that college was not quite the romantic lyceum I had imagined. Many of the dreams that had delighted my young and experience became beautifully less and faded into the light of common day. Gradually I began to find that there were disadvantages in going to college. The one I felt, and still feel most, is lack of time. I used to have time to think, to reflect, my mind and I. We would sit together of an evening and listen to the inner melodies of the spirit, which one hears only in leisure moments, when the words of some loved poet touch a deep, sweet chord in the soul that until then had been silent. But in college there is no time to commune with one's thoughts. One goes to college to learn, it seems, not to think. When one enters the portals of learning, one leaves the dearest pleasures, solitude, books and imagination, outside with the whispering pines. I suppose I ought to find some comfort in the thought that I am laying up treasures for future enjoyment, but I am improvident enough to prefer present joy to hoarding riches against a rainy day. My studies the first year were French, German, history, English composition, and English literature. In the French course I read some of the works of Corneille, Molière, Racine, Alfred de Musset, and Saint-Beuve, and in the German those of Goethe and Schiller. I reviewed rapidly the whole period of history from the fall of the Roman Empire to the 18th century, 
and in English literature studied critically Milton's poems and Areopagitica. I am frequently asked how I overcome the peculiar conditions under which I work in college. In the classroom I am of course practically alone. The professor is as remote as if he were speaking through a telephone. The lectures are spelled into my hand as rapidly as possible, and much of the individuality of the lecturer is lost to me in the effort to keep in the race. The words rush through my hand like hounds in pursuit of a hare which they often miss. But in this respect I do not think I am much worse off than the girls who take notes. If the mind is occupied with the mechanical process of hearing and putting words on paper at pell-mell speed, I should not think one could pay much attention to the subject under consideration or the manner in which it is presented. I cannot make notes during the lectures because my hands are busy listening. Usually I jot down what I can remember of them when I get home. I write the exercises, daily themes, criticisms and hour tests, the mid-year and final examinations on my typewriter, so that the professors have no difficulty in finding out how little I know. When I began the study of Latin prosody, I devised and explained to my professor a system of signs indicating the different meters and quantities. I use the Hammond typewriter. I have tried many machines and I find the Hammond is the best adapted to the peculiar needs of my work. With this machine, movable type shuttles can be used, and one can have several shuttles, each with a different set of characters, Greek, French, or mathematical, according to the kind of writing one wishes to do on the typewriter. Without it, I doubt if I could go to college. Very few of the books required in the various courses are printed for the blind, and I am obliged to have them spelled into my hand. Consequently, I need more time to prepare my lessons than other girls. The manual part takes longer, and I have perplexities which they have not. There are days when the close attention I must give to details chafes my spirit, and the thought that I must spend hours reading a few chapters, while in the world without other girls are laughing and singing and dancing, makes me rebellious. But I soon recover my buoyancy and laugh the discontent out of my heart. For after all, everyone who wishes to gain true knowledge must climb the hill difficulty alone, and since there is no royal road to the summit, I must zigzag it in my own way. I slip back many times, I fall, I stand still, I run against the edge of hidden obstacles, I lose my temper and find it again and keep it better. I trudge on, I gain a little, I feel encouraged, I get more eager and climb higher and begin to see the widening horizon. Every struggle is a victory. One more effort, and I reach the luminous cloud, the blue depths of the sky, the uplands of my desire. I am not always alone, however, in these struggles. Mr. William Wade and Mr. E. E. Allen, principal of the Pennsylvanian Institution for the Instruction of the Blind, get for me many of the books I need in raised print. Their thoughtfulness has been more of a help and encouragement to me than they can ever know. Last year, my second year at Radcliffe, I studied the English composition, the Bible as English literature, the governments of America and Europe, the O's of Horace, and Latin comedy. The class in composition was the pleasantest. It was very lively. The lectures were always interesting, vivacious, witty, for the instructor, Mr. Charles Townsend Copeland, more than anyone else I have had until this year, brings before you literature in all its original freshness and power. For one short hour you are permitted to drink in the eternal beauty of the old masters without needless interpretation or exposition. You revel in their fine thoughts. You enjoy with all your soul the sweet thunder of the Old Testament, forgetting the existence of Yahweh and Elohim, and you go home feeling that you have had the glimpse of that perfection in which spirit and form dwell in immortal harmony, truth and beauty bearing a new growth on the ancient stem of time. This year is the happiest because I am studying subjects that especially interest me, economics, Elizabethan literature, Shakespeare under Professor George L. Kittredge, and the history of philosophy under Professor Josiah Royce. 
Through philosophy, one enters with sympathy of comprehension into the traditions of remote ages and other modes of thought, which erewhile seemed alien and without reason. But college is not the universal Athens I thought it was. There one does not meet the great and the wise face to face. One does not even feel their living touch. They are there, it is true, but they seem mummified. We must extract them from the crannied wall of learning and dissect and analyze them before we can be sure that we have a Milton or an Isaiah and not merely a clever imitation. Many scholars forget, it seems to me, that our enjoyment of the great works of literature depends more upon the depth of our sympathy than upon our understanding. The trouble is that very few of their laborious explanations stick in the memory. The mind drops them as a branch drops its overripe fruit. It is possible to know a flower, root and stem and all, and all the processes of growth, and yet to have no appreciation of the flower fresh bathed in heaven's dew. Again and again I ask impatiently, why concern myself with these explanations and hypotheses? They fly hither and thither in my thought like blind birds beating the air with ineffectual wings. I do not mean to object to a thorough knowledge of the famous works we read. I object only to the interminable comments and bewildering criticisms that teach but one thing. There are as many opinions as there are men. But when a great scholar like Professor Kittredge interprets what the Master said, it is as if new sight were given the blind. He brings back Shakespeare, the poet. There are, however, times when I long to sweep away half the things I am expected to learn, for the overtaxed mind cannot enjoy the treasure it had secured at the greatest cost. It is impossible, I think, to read in one day four or five different books in different languages and treating of widely different subjects, and not lose sight of the very ends for which one reads. When one reads hurriedly and nervously, having in mind written tests and examinations, one's brain becomes encumbered with a lot of choice bric-a-brac for which there seems to be little use. At the present time my mind is so full of heterogeneous matter that I almost despair of ever being able to put it in order. Whenever I enter the region that was the kingdom of my mind, I feel like the proverbial bull in the china shop. A thousand odds and ends of knowledge come crashing about my head like hailstones, and when I try to escape them, theme goblins and college nixties of all sorts pursue me, until I wish, oh, may I be forgiven the wicked wish, that I might smash the idols I came to worship. But the examinations are the chief bugbears of my college life. Although I have faced them many times, and cast them down, and made them bite the dust, yet they rise again and menace me with pale looks, until, like Bob Akers, I feel my courage woozing out at my finger-ends. The days before these ordeals take place are spent in cramming your mind with mystic formulae and indigestible dates, unpalatable diets, until you wish that books and science and you were buried in the depths of the sea. At last the dreaded hour arrives, and you are a favoured being indeed if you feel prepared and are able at the right time to call your standard thoughts that will aid you in that supreme effort. It happens too often that your trumpet call is unheeded. It is most perplexing and exasperating that just at the moment when you need your memory and a nice sense of discrimination, these faculties take to themselves wings and fly away. The facts you have garnered with such infinite trouble invariably fail you at the pinch. Give a brief account of Huss and his work. Huss? Who was he, and what did he do? The name looks strangely familiar. You ransack your budget of historic facts much as you would hunt for a bit of silk in a rag-bag. You are sure it is somewhere in your mind near the top. You saw it there the other day, when you were looking up the beginnings of the Reformation. But where is it now? You fish out all manner of odds and ends of knowledge, revolutions, schisms, massacres, systems of government. But Huss? Where is he? You are amazed at all the things you know which are not on the examination paper. In desperation you seize the budget and dump everything out, and there, in a corner, is your man, serenely brooding on his own private thought, unconscious of the catastrophe which he has brought upon you. 
Just then the proctor informs you that the time is up. With a feeling of intense disgust, you kick the mass of rubbish into a corner and go home, your head full of revolutionary schemes to abolish the divine right of professors to ask questions without the consent of the questioned. It comes over me that in the last two or three pages of this chapter I have used figures which will turn the laugh against me. Ah, here they are, the mixed metaphors mocking and strutting about before me, pointing to the bull in the china shop assailed by hailstones and the bugbears with pale looks and unanalyzed species. Let them mock on. The words describe so exactly the atmosphere of jostling, tumbling ideas I live in that I will wink at them for once and put on a deliberate air to say that my ideas of college have changed. While my days at Radcliffe were still in the future, they were encircled with a halo of romance, which they have lost. But in the transition from romantic to actual, I have learned many things I should never have known had I not tried the experiment. One of them is the precious science of patience, which teaches us that we should take our education as we would take a walk in the country, leisurely, our minds hospitably open to impressions of every sort. Such knowledge floods the soul unseen with a soundless tidal wave of deepening thought. Knowledge is power. Rather, knowledge is happiness, because to have knowledge, broad, deep knowledge, is to know true ends from false and lofty things from low. To know the thoughts and deeds that have marked man's progress is to feel the great heart-throbs of humanity through the centuries. And if one does not feel in these pulsations a heavenward striving, one must indeed be deaf to the harmonies of life. End of chapter 20《of the story of my life》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Story of My Life》by Helen Keller Chapter 21 I have thus far sketched the events of my life, but I have not shown how much I have depended on books, not only for pleasure and for the wisdom they bring to all who read, but also for that knowledge which comes to others through their eyes and their ears. Indeed, books have meant so much more in my education than in that of others, that I shall go back to the time when I began to read. I read my first connected story in May 1887, when I was seven years old, and from that day to this I have devoured everything in the shape of a printed page that has come within the reach of my hungry fingertips. As I have said, I did not study regularly during the early years of my education, nor did I read according to rule. At first I had only a few books in raised print, readers for beginners, a collection of stories for children, and a book about the earth called Our World. I think that was all, but I read them over and over until the words were so worn and pressed I could scarcely make them out. Sometimes Miss Sullivan read to me, spelling into my hand little stories and poems that she knew I should understand, but I preferred reading myself to being read to, because I liked to read again and again the things that pleased me. It was during my first visit to Boston that I really began to read in good earnest. I was permitted to spend a part of each day in the institution library, and to wander from bookcase to bookcase and take down whatever book my fingers lighted upon. And read I did, whether I understood one word in ten or two words on a page. The words themselves fascinated me, but I took no conscious account of what I read. My mind must, however, have been very impressionable at that period, for it retained many words and whole sentences to the meaning of which I had not the faintest clue. And afterward, when I began to talk and write, these words and sentences would flash out quite naturally, so that my friends wondered at the richness of my vocabulary. I must have read parts of many books. In those early days I think I never read any one book through, and a great deal of poetry in this uncomprehending way, until I discovered Little Lord Fauntleroy, which was the first book of any consequence I read understandingly. 
One day, my teacher found me in a corner of the library, poring over the pages of the scarlet letter. I was then about eight years old. I remember she asked me if I liked Little Pearl, and explained some of the words that had puzzled me. Then she told me that she had a beautiful story about a little boy, which she was sure I should like better than the scarlet letter. The name of the story was Little Lord Fauntleroy, and she promised to read it to me the following summer. But we did not begin the story until August. The first few weeks of my stay at the seashore were so full of discoveries and excitement that I forgot the very existence of books. Then my teacher went to visit some friends in Boston, leaving me for a short time. When she returned, almost the first thing we did was to begin the story of little Lord Fauntleroy. I recall distinctly the time and place when we read the first chapters of the fascinating child's story. It was a warm afternoon in August. We were sitting together in a hammock which swung from two solemn pines at a short distance from the house. We had hurried through the dishwashing after luncheon in order that we might have as long an afternoon as possible for the story. As we hastened through the long grass toward the hammock, the grasshoppers swarmed about us and fastened themselves on our clothes, and I remember that my teacher insisted upon picking them all off before we sat down, which seemed to me an unnecessary waste of time. The hammock was covered with pine needles, for it had not been used while my teacher was away. The warm sun shone on the pine trees and drew out all their fragrance. The air was balmy, with a tang of the sea in it. Before we began the story, Miss Sullivan explained to me the things that she knew I should not understand, and as we read on, she explained the unfamiliar words. At first there were many words I did not know, and the reading was constantly interrupted. But as soon as I thoroughly comprehended the situation, I became too eagerly absorbed in the story to notice mere words, and I am afraid I listened impatiently to the explanations that Miss Sullivan felt to be necessary. When her fingers were too tired to spell another word, I had, for the first time, a keen sense of my deprivations. I took the book in my hands and tried to feel the letters with an intensity of longing that I can never forget. Afterward, at my eager request, Mr. Anagnos had the story embossed, and I read it again and again until I almost knew it by heart and all through my childhood little Lord Fauntleroy was my sweet and gentle companion. I have given these details at the risk of being tedious, because they are in such vivid contrast with my vague, mutable, and confused memories of earlier reading. From little Lord Fauntleroy I date the beginning of my true interest in books. During the next two years I read many books at my home and on my visits to Boston. I cannot remember what they all were, or in what order I read them, but I know that among them were Greek heroes, La Fontaine's fables, Hawthorne's wonder book, Bible stories, Lamb's tales from Shakespeare, A Child's History of England by Dickens, The Arabian Nights, The Swiss Family Robinson, The Pilgrim's Progress, Robinson Crusoe, Little Women, and Heidi, a beautiful little story which I afterward read in German. I read them in the intervals between study and play with an ever-deepening sense of pleasure. I did not study nor analyze them. I did not know whether they were well written or not. I never thought about style or authorship. They laid their treasures at my feet, and I accepted them as we accept the sunshine and the love of our friends. I loved little women because it gave me a sense of kinship with girls and boys who could see and hear. Circumscribed as my life was in so many ways, I had to look between the covers of books for news of the world that lay outside my own. I did not care especially for the Pilgrim's Progress, which I think I did not finish, or for the fables. I read La Fontaine's fables first in an English translation, and enjoyed them only after a half-hearted fashion. Later I read the book again in French, and I found that, in spite of the vivid word-pictures and the wonderful mastery of language, I liked it no better. I do not know why it is, 
but stories in which animals are made to talk and act like human beings have never appealed to me very strongly. The ludicrous caricatures of the animals occupy my mind to the exclusion of the moral. Then again, La Fontaine seldom, if ever, appeals to our higher moral sense. The highest chords he strikes are those of reason and self-love. Through all the fables runs the thought that man's morality springs wholly from self-love, and that if that self-love is directed and restrained by reason, happiness must follow. Now, so far as I can judge, self-love is the root of all evil. But of course I may be wrong, for La Fontaine had greater opportunities of observing men than I am likely ever to have. I do not object so much to the cynical and satirical fables as to those in which momentous truths are taught by monkeys and foxes. But I love the jungle book and wild animals I have known. I feel a genuine interest in the animals themselves, because they are real animals and not caricatures of men. One sympathizes with their loves and hatreds, laughs over their comedies, and weeps over their tragedies. And if they point a moral, it is so subtle that we are not conscious of it. My mind opened naturally and joyously to a conception of antiquity. Greece, ancient Greece, exercised a mysterious fascination over me. In my fancy, the pagan gods and goddesses still walked on earth and talked face to face with men, and in my heart I secretly built shrines to those I loved best. I knew and loved the whole tribe of nymphs and heroes and demigods. No, not quite all, for the cruelty and greed of Medea and Jason were too monstrous to be forgiven, and I used to wonder why the gods permitted them to do wrong and then punished them for their wickedness. And the mystery is still unsolved. I often wonder how God can dumbness keep while sin creeps grinning through his house of time. It was the Iliad that made Greece my paradise. I was familiar with the story of Troy before I read it in the original, and consequently I had little difficulty in making the Greek words surrender their treasures after I had passed the borderland of grammar. Great poetry, whether written in Greek or in English, needs no other interpreter than a responsive heart. Would that the host of those who make the great works of the poets odious by their analysis, impositions, and laborious comments might learn this simple truth. It is not necessary that one should be able to define every word and give it its principal parts and its grammatical position in the sentence in order to understand and appreciate a fine poem. I know my learned professors have found greater riches in the Iliad than I shall ever find, but I am not avaricious. I am content that others should be wiser than I, but with all their wide and comprehensive knowledge they cannot measure their enjoyment of that splendid epic, nor can I. When I read the finest passages of the Iliad I am conscious of a soul sense that lifts me above the narrow, cramping circumstances of my life. My physical limitations are forgotten. My world lies upward. The length and the breadth and the sweep of the heavens are mine. My admiration for the Aeneid is not so great, but it is none the less real. I read it as much as possible without the help of notes or dictionary, and I always liked to translate the episodes that pleased me especially. The word-painting of Virgil is wonderful sometimes, but his gods and men move through the scenes of passion and strife and pity and love like the graceful figures in an Elizabethan mask, whereas in the Iliad they give three leaps and go on singing. Virgil is serene and lovely like a marble Apollo in the moonlight. Homer is a beautiful animated youth in the full sunlight with the wind in his hair. How easy it is to fly on paper wings! From Greek heroes to the Iliad was no day's journey, nor was it altogether pleasant. One could have travelled round the world many times while I trudged my weary way through the labyrinthine mazes of grammars and dictionaries, or fell into those dreadful pitfalls called examinations, set by schools and colleges for the confusion of those who seek after knowledge. 
I suppose this sort of pilgrim's progress was justified by the end, but it seemed interminable to me, in spite of the pleasant surprises that met me now and then at a turn in the road. I began to read the Bible long before I could understand it. Now it seemed strange to me that there should have been a time when my spirit was deaf to its wondrous harmonies. But I remember well a rainy Sunday morning when, having nothing else to do, I begged my cousin to read me a story out of the Bible. Although she did not think I should understand, she began to spell into my hand the story of Joseph and his brothers. Somehow it failed to interest me. The unusual language and repetition made the story seem unreal and far away in the land of Canaan, and I fell asleep and wandered off to the land of Nod, before the brothers came with the coat of many colours unto the tent of Jacob, and told their wicked lie. I cannot understand why the stories of the Greeks should have been so full of charm for me, and those of the Bible so devoid of interest unless it was that I had made the acquaintance of several Greeks in Boston, and been inspired by their enthusiasm for the stories of their country, whereas I had not met a single Hebrew or Egyptian, and therefore concluded that they were nothing more than barbarians, and the stories about them were probably all made up. Curiously enough, it never occurred to me to call Greek patronymics queer, but how shall I speak of the glories I have since discovered in the Bible? For years I have read it with an ever-broadening sense of joy and inspiration, and I love it as I love no other book. Still, there is much in the Bible against which every instinct of my being rebels, so much that I regret the necessity which has compelled me to read it through from beginning to end. I do not think that the knowledge which I have gained of its history and sources compensates me for the unpleasant details it has forced upon my attention. For my part, I wish, with Mr. Howells, that the literature of the past might be purged of all that is ugly and barbarous in it, although I should object as much as any one to have these great works weakened or falsified. There is something impressive, awful, in the simplicity and terrible directness of the book of Esther. Could there be anything more dramatic than the scene in which Esther stands before her wicked lord? She knows her life is in his hands, there is no one to protect her from his wrath. Yet, conquering her woman's fear, she approaches him, animated by the noblest patriotism, having but one thought, If I perish, I perish but if I live, my people shall live. The story of Ruth, too, how oriental it is! Yet how different is the life of these simple country folks from that of the Persian capital! Ruth is so loyal and gentle-hearted, we cannot help loving her, as she stands with the reapers amid the waving corn. Her beautiful and selfish spirit shines out like a bright star in the night or a dark and cruel age. Love, like Ruth's, love which can rise above conflicting creeds and deep-seated racial prejudices, is hard to find in all the world. The Bible gives me a deep, comforting sense that things seen are temporal, and things unseen are eternal. I do not remember a time since I have been capable of loving books that I have not loved Shakespeare. I cannot tell exactly when I began Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare, but I know that I read them at first with a child's understanding and a child's wonder. Macbeth seems to have impressed me most. One reading was sufficient to stamp every detail of the story upon my memory forever. For a long time the ghosts and witches pursued me even into dreamland. I could see absolutely see the dagger and Lady Macbeth's little white hand. The dreadful stain was as real to me as to the grief-stricken queen. I read King Lear soon after Macbeth, and I shall never forget the feeling of horror when I came to the scene in which Gloucester's eyes are put out. Anger seized me, my fingers refused to move. I sat rigid for one long moment, the blood throbbing in my temples, and all the hatred that a child can feel concentrated in my heart. I must have made the acquaintance of Shylock and Satan about the same time, for the two characters were long associated in my mind. I remember that I was sorry for them. 
I felt vaguely that they could not be good even if they wished to, because no one seemed willing to help them or to give them a fair chance. Even now I cannot find it in my heart to condemn them utterly. There are moments when I feel that the Shylocks, the Judases, and even the Devil are broken spokes in the great wheel of good which shall in due time be made whole. It seems strange that my first reading of Shakespeare should have left me so many unpleasant memories. The bright, gentle, fanciful plays, the ones I like best now, appear not to have impressed me at first, perhaps because they reflected the habitual sunshine and gaiety of a child's life but there is nothing more capricious than the memory of a child, what it will hold and what it will lose. I have since read Shakespeare's plays many times, and know parts of them by heart, but I cannot tell which of them I like best. My delight in them is as varied as my moods. The little songs and the sonnets have a meaning for me as fresh and wonderful as the dramas. But with all my love for Shakespeare, it is often weary work to read all the meanings into his lines which critics and commentators have given them. I used to try to remember their interpretations, but they discouraged and vexed me, so I made a secret compact with myself not to try any more. This compact I have only just broken in my study of Shakespeare under Professor Kittredge. I know there are many things in Shakespeare and in the world that I do not understand, and I am glad to see veil after veil lift gradually, revealing new realms of thought and beauty. Next to poetry I love history. I have read every historical work that I have been able to lay my hands on, from a catalogue of dry facts and drier dates to Green's impartial picturesque history of the English people, from Freeman's History of Europe to Emerton's Middle Ages. The first book that gave me any real sense of the value of history was Swinton's World's History, which I received on my thirteenth birthday. Though I believe it is no longer considered valid, yet I have kept it ever since as one of my treasures. From it I learned how the races of men spread from land to land and built great cities, how a few great rulers, earthly titans, put everything under their feet, and with a decisive word opened the gates of happiness for millions and closed them upon millions more. How different nations pioneered in art and knowledge and broke ground for the mightier growths of coming ages. How civilization underwent, as it were, the holocaust of a degenerate age, and rose again, like the phoenix, among the nobler sons of the north. And how, by liberty, tolerance, and education, the great and the wise have opened the way for the salvation of the whole world. In my college reading I have become somewhat familiar with French and German literature. The German puts strength before beauty, and truth before convention, both in life and in literature. There is a vehement sledgehammer vigour about everything that he does. When he speaks it is not to impress others, but because his heart would burst if he did not find an outlet for the thoughts that burn in its soul. Then, too, there is in German literature a fine reserve which I like, but its chief glory is the recognition I find in it of the redeeming potency of woman's self-sacrificing love. This thought pervades all German literature and is mystically expressed in Goethe's Faust. All things transitory but as symbols are sent. Earth's insufficiency here grows to event. The indescribable, here it is done. The woman soul leads us upward and on. Of all the French writers that I have read, I like Molière and Racine best. There are fine things in Balzac and passages in Merimée which strike one like a keen blast of sea air. Alfred de Musset is impossible. I admire Victor Hugo. I appreciate his genius, his brilliancy, his romanticism, though he is not one of my literary passions. But Hugo and Goethe and Schiller and all great poets of all great nations are interpreters of eternal things, and my spirit reverently follows them into the regions where beauty and truth and goodness are one. I am afraid I have written too much about my book friends, and yet I have mentioned only the authors I love most. 
and from this fact one might easily suppose that my circle of friends was very limited and undemocratic, which would be a very wrong impression. I like many writers for many reasons. Carlyle for his ruggedness and scorn of shams. Wordsworth, who teaches the oneness of man and nature. I find an exquisite pleasure in the oddities and surprises of Hood, in Herrick's quaintness and the palpable scent of lily and rose in his verses. I like Whittier for his enthusiasms and moral rectitude. I knew him, and the gentle remembrance of our friendship doubles the pleasure I have in reading his poems. I love Mark Twain, who does not? The gods, too, loved him, and put into his heart all manner of wisdom. Then, fearing lest he should become a pessimist, they spanned his mind with a rainbow of love and faith. I like Scott for his freshness, dash and large honesty. I love all writers whose minds, like Lowell's, bubble up in the sunshine of optimism, fountains of joy and goodwill, with occasionally a splash of anger and here and there a healing spray of sympathy and pity. In a word, literature is my utopia. Here I am not disfranchised. No barrier of the senses shuts me out from the sweet, gracious discourse of my book friends. They talk to me without embarrassment or awkwardness. The things I have learned and the things I have been taught seem of ridiculously little importance compared with their large loves and heavenly charities. End of chapter 21Twenty two of the story of my life. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of My Life by Helen Keller. Chapter twenty two. I trust that my readers have not concluded from the preceding chapter on books that reading is my only pleasure. My pleasures and amusements are many and varied. More than once in the course of my story I have referred to my love of the country and out-of-door sports. When I was quite a little girl I learned to row and swim, and during the summer, when I am at Trentham, Massachusetts, I almost live in my boat. Nothing gives me greater pleasure than to take my friends out rowing when they come to visit me. Of course I cannot guide the boat very well. Someone usually sits in the stern and manages the rudder while I row. Sometimes, however, I go rowing without the rudder. It is fun to try to steer by the scent of water-grasses and lilies, and of bushes that grow on the shore. I use oars with leather bands, which keep them in position in the oar-locks, and I know by the resistance of the water when the oars are evenly poised. In the same manner I can also tell when I am pulling against the current. I like to contend with wind and wave. What is more exhilarating than to make your staunch little boat, obedient to your will and muscle, go skimming lightly over glistening, tilting waves, and to feel the steady, imperious surge of the water? I also enjoy canoeing, and I suppose you will smile when I say that I especially like it on moonlight nights. I cannot, it is true, see the moon climb up the sky behind the pines and steal softly across the heavens, making a shining path for us to follow. But I know she is there, and as I lie back among the pillows and put my hand in the water, I fancy that I feel the shimmer of her garments as she passes. Sometimes a daring little fish slips between my fingers, and often a pond lily presses shyly against my hand. Frequently, as we emerge from the shelter of a cove or inlet, I am suddenly conscious of the spaciousness of the air about me. A luminous warmth seems to enfold me. Whether it comes from the trees which have been heated by the sun, or from the water, I can never discover. I have had the same strange sensation even in the heart of the city. I have felt it on cold, stormy days and at night. It is like the kiss of warm lips on my face. My favorite amusement is sailing. In the summer of 1901 I visited Nova Scotia and had opportunities such as I had not enjoyed before to make the acquaintance of the ocean. After spending a few days in Evangeline's country, 
about which Longfellow's beautiful poem has woven a spell of enchantment, Miss Sullivan and I went to Halifax, where we remained the greater part of the summer. The harbour was our joy, our paradise. What glorious sails we had to Bedford Basin, to McNabb's Island, to York Redoubt, and to the Northwest Arm! And at night what soothing, wondrous hours we spent in the shadow of the great silent men of war! Oh, it was all so interesting, so beautiful! The memory of it is a joy for ever. One day we had the thrilling experience. There was a regatta in the northwest arm in which the boats from the different warships were engaged. We went in a sailboat along with many others to watch the races. Hundreds of little sailboats swung to and fro close by, and the sea was calm. When the races were over, and we turned our faces homeward, one of the party noticed a black cloud drifting in from the sea, which grew and spread and thickened until it covered the whole sky. The wind rose, and the waves chopped angrily at unseen barriers. Our little boat confronted the gale fearlessly. With sails spread and ropes taut, she seemed to sit upon the wind. Now she swirled in the billows, now she sprang upward on a gigantic wave, only to be driven down with angry howl and hiss. Down came the mainsail. Tacking and jibbing, we wrestled with opposing winds that drove us from side to side with impetuous fury. Our hearts beat fast, and our hands trembled with excitement, not fear. For we had the hearts of Vikings, and we knew that our skipper was master of the situation. He had steered through many a storm with firm hand and sea-wise eye. As they passed us, the large craft and the gunboats in the harbour saluted, and the seamen shouted applause for the master of the only little sailboat that ventured out into the storm. At last, cold, hungry, and weary, we reached our pier. Last summer I spent in one of the loveliest nooks of one of the most charming villages in New England. Wrentham, Massachusetts, is associated with nearly all of my joys and sorrows. For many years Red Farm, the home of Mr. J. E. Chamberlain and his family, was my home. I remember with deepest gratitude the kindness of these dear friends and the happy days I spent with them. The sweet companionship of their children meant much to me. I joined in all their sports and rambles through the woods and frolics in the water. The prattle of the little ones and their pleasure in the stories I told them of elf and gnome, of hero and wily bear, are pleasant things to remember. Mr. Chamberlain initiated me into the mysteries of tree and wild flower, until with the little ear of love I heard the flow of sap in the oak, and saw the sun glint from leaf to leaf. Thus it is that, even as the roots shut in the darksome earth share in the treetops joyance, and conceive of sunshine and wide air and winged things, by sympathy of nature, so do I, gave evidence of things unseen. It seems to me that there is in each of us a capacity to comprehend the impressions and emotions which have been experienced by mankind from the beginning. Each individual has a subconscious memory of the green earth and murmuring waters, and blindness and deafness cannot rob him of this gift from past generations. This inherited capacity is a sort of sixth sense, a soul sense which sees, hears, feels, all in one. I have many tree friends in Wrentham. One of them, a splendid oak, is the special pride of my heart. I take all my other friends to see this king tree. It stands on a bluff overlooking King Philip's pond, and those who are wise in tree lore say it must have stood there eight hundred or a thousand years. There is a tradition that under this tree King Philip, the heroic Indian chief, gazed his last on earth and sky. I had another tree friend, gentle and more approachable than the great oak, a linden that grew in the dooryard at Red Farm. One afternoon, during a terrible thunderstorm, I felt a tremendous crash against the side of the house, and knew, even before they told me, that the linden had fallen. We went out to see the hero that had withstood so many tempests, 
and it wrung my heart to see him prostrate, who had mightily striven, and was now mightily fallen. But I must not forget that I was going to write about last summer in particular. As soon as my examinations were over, Miss Sullivan and I hastened to this green nook, where we have a little cottage on one of the three lakes for which Rentham is famous. Here the long sunny days were mine, and all thoughts of work and college and the noisy city were thrust into the background. In Rentham we caught echoes of what was happening in the world, war, alliance, social conflict. We heard of the cruel, unnecessary fighting in the faraway Pacific, and learned of the struggles going on between capital and labor. We knew that beyond the border of our Eden men were making history by the sweat of their brows when they might better make a holiday. But we little heeded these things. These things would pass away. Here were lakes and woods and broad daisy-starred fields and sweet-breathed meadows, and they shall endure forever. People who think that all sensations reach us through the eye and the ear have expressed surprise that I should notice any difference, except possibly the absence of pavements between walking in city streets and in country roads. They forget that my whole body is alive to the conditions about me. The rumble and roar of the city smite the nerves of my face, and I feel the ceaseless tramp of an unseen multitude, and the dissonant tumult frets my spirit. The grinding of heavy wagons on hard pavements and the monotonous clangor of machinery are all the more torturing to the nerves if one's attention is not diverted by the panorama that is always present in the noisy streets to people who can see. In the country one sees only nature's fair works, and one's soul is not saddened by the cruel struggle for mere existence that goes on in the crowded city. Several times I have visited the narrow, dirty streets where the poor live, and I grow hot and indignant to think that good people should be content to live in fine houses and become strong and beautiful, while others are condemned to live in hideous, sunless tenements and grow ugly, withered, and cringing. The children who crowd these grimy alleys, half-clad and underfed, shrink away from your outstretched hand as if from a blow. Dear little creatures, they crouch in my heart and haunt me with a constant sense of pain. There are men and women, too, all gnarled and bent out of shape. I have felt their hard, rough hands and realized what an endless struggle their existence must be, no more than a series of scrimmages, thwarted attempts to do something. Their life seems an immense disparity between effort and opportunity. The sun and the air are God's free gifts to all, we say, but are they so? In yonder city's dingy alleys the sun shines not, and the air is foul. O oh man, how dost thou forget and obstruct thy brother man, and say, Give us this day our daily bread, when he has none? Oh, would that men would leave the city, its splendor and its tumult and its gold, and return to wood and field and simple honest living! Then would their children grow stately as noble trees, and their thoughts sweet and pure as wayside flowers. It is impossible not to think of all this when I return to the country after a year of work in town. What a joy it is to feel the soft, springy earth under my feet once more, to follow grassy roads that lead to ferny brooks where I can bathe my fingers in the cataract of rippling notes, or to clamber over a stone wall into green fields that tumble and roll and climb in riotous gladness. Next to a leisurely walk I enjoy a spin on my tandem bicycle. It is splendid to feel the wind blowing in my face and the springy motion of my iron steed. The rapid rush through the air gives me a delicious sense of strength and buoyancy, and the exercise makes my pulses dance and my heart sing. Whenever it is possible, my dog accompanies me on a walk or a ride or a sail. I have had many dog friends, huge mastiffs, soft-eyed spaniels, wood-wide setters, and honest homely bull terriers. At present, the lord of my affections is one of these bull terriers. He has a long pedigree, a crooked tail, and the drollest fizz in dogdom. 
My dog friends seem to understand my limitations, and always keep close beside me when I am alone. I love their affectionate ways and the eloquent wag of their tails. When a rainy day keeps me indoors, I amuse myself after the manner of other girls. I like to knit and crochet. I read in the happy-go-lucky way I love, here and there a line, or perhaps I play a game or two of checkers or chess with a friend. I have a special board on which I play these games. The squares are cut out, so that the men stand in them firmly. The black checkers are flat and the white ones curved on top. Each checker has a hole in the middle, in which a brass knob can be placed to distinguish the king from the commons. The chessmen are of two sizes, the white larger than the black, so that I have no trouble in following my opponent's manoeuvres by moving my hands lightly over the board after a play. The jar made by shifting the men from one hole to another tells me when it is my turn. If I happen to be all alone and in an idle mood, I play a game of solitaire, of which I am very fond. I use playing cards marked in the upper right-hand corner with braille symbols which indicate the value of the card. If there are children around, nothing pleases me so much as to frolic with them. I find even the smallest child excellent company, and I am glad to say that children usually like me. They lead me about and show me the things they are interested in. Of course, the little ones cannot spell on their fingers, but I manage to read their lips. If I do not succeed, they resort to dumb show. Sometimes I make a mistake and do the wrong thing. A burst of childish laughter greets my blunder, and the pantomime begins all over again. I often tell them stories or teach them a game, and the winged hours depart and leave us good and happy. Museums and art stores are also sources of pleasure and inspiration. Doubtless it will seem strange to many that the hand unaided by sight can feel action, sentiment, beauty in the cold marble, and yet it is true that I derive genuine pleasure from touching great works of art. As my fingertips trace line and curve, they discover the thought and emotion which the artist has portrayed. I can feel in the faces of gods and heroes hate, courage, and love, just as I can detect them in living faces I am permitted to touch. I feel in Diana's posture the grace and freedom of the forest and the spirit that tames the mountain lion and subdues the fiercest passions. My soul delights in the repose and gracious curves of the Venus, and in Bard's bronzes the secrets of the jungle are revealed to me. A medallion of Homer hangs on the wall of my study, conveniently low, so that I can easily reach it and touch the beautiful, sad face with loving reverence. How well I know each line in that majestic brow, tracks of life and bitter evidences of struggle and sorrow. Those sightless eyes seeking, even in the cold plaster, for the light and the blue skies of his beloved Hellas, but seeking in vain, that beautiful mouth, firm and true and tender. It is the face of a poet and of a man acquainted with sorrow. Ah, how well I understand his deprivation, the perpetual night in which he dwelt. O oh, dark, dark amid the blaze of noon, irrecoverably dark, total eclipse, without all hope of day. In imagination I can hear Homer singing, as with unsteady, hesitating steps he gropes his way from camp to camp, singing of life, of love, of war, of the splendid achievements of a noble race. It was a wonderful, glorious song, and it won the blind poet an immortal crown, the admiration of all ages. I sometimes wonder if the hand is not more sensitive to the beauties of sculpture than the eye. I should think the wonderful rhythmical flow of lines and curves could be more subtly felt than seen. Be this as it may, I know that I can feel the heart-throbs of the ancient Greeks in their marble gods and goddesses. Another pleasure, which comes more rarely than the others, is going to the theatre. 
I enjoy having a play described to me while it is being acted on the stage far more than reading it, because then it seems as if I were living in the midst of stirring events. It has been my privilege to meet a few great actors and actresses who have the power of so bewitching you that you forget time and place and live again in the romantic past. I have been permitted to touch the face and costume of Miss Ellen Terry as she impersonated our ideal of a queen, and there was about her that divinity that hedged sublimest woe. Beside her stood Sir Henry Irving, wearing the symbols of kinship, and there was majesty of intellect in his every gesture and attitude, and the royalty that subdues and overcomes in every line of his sensitive face. In the king's face, which he wore as a mask, there was a remoteness and inaccessibility of grief which I shall never forget. I also know Mr. Jefferson. I am proud to count him among my friends. I go to see him whenever I happen to be where he is acting. The first time I saw him act was while at school in New York. He played Rip Van Winkle. I had often read the story, but I had never felt the charm of Rip's slow, quaint, kind ways as I did in the play. Mr. Jefferson's beautiful, pathetic representation quite carried me away with delight. I have a picture of old Rip in my fingers, which they will never lose. After the play, Miss Sullivan took me to see him behind the scenes, and I felt of his curious garb and his flowing hair and beard. Mr. Jefferson let me touch his face so that I could imagine how he looked on waking from that strange sleep of twenty years, and he showed me how poor old Rip staggered to his feet. I have also seen him in The Rivals. Once, while I was calling on him in Boston, he acted the most striking parts of The Rivals for me. The reception room where we sat served for a stage. He and his son seated themselves at the big table, and Bob Akers wrote his challenge. I followed all his movements with my hands, and caught the drollery of his blunders and gestures in a way that would have been impossible had it all been spelled to me. Then they rose to fight the duel, and I followed the swift thrusts and parries of the saws, and the waverings of poor Bob as his courage woozed out at his finger-ends. Then the great actor gave his coat a hitch and his mouth a twitch, and in an instant I was in the village of falling water and felt Schneider's shaggy head against my knee. Mr. Jefferson recited the best dialogues of Rip Van Winkle, in which the tear came close upon the smile. He asked me to indicate as far as I could the gestures and action that should go with the lines. Of course, I have no sense whatever of dramatic action, and could make only random guesses, but with masterful art he suited the action to the word. The sigh of Rip, as he murmurs, is a man so soon forgotten when he is gone, the dismay with which he searches for dog and gun after his long sleep, and his comical irresolution over signing the contract with Derrick, all these seem to be right out of life itself that is, the ideal life, where things happen as we think they should. I remember well the first time I went to the theatre. It was twelve years ago. Elsie Leslie, the little actress, was in Boston, and Miss Sullivan took me to see her in The Prince and the Pauper. I shall never forget the ripple of alternating joy and woe that ran through that beautiful little play, or the wonderful child who acted it. After the play I was permitted to go behind the scenes and meet her in her royal costume. It would have been hard to find a lovelier or more lovable child than Elsie, as she stood with a cloud of golden hair floating over her shoulders, smiling brightly, showing no signs of shyness or fatigue, though she had been playing to an immense audience. I was only just learning to speak, and had previously repeated her name until I could say it perfectly. Imagine my delight when she understood the few words I spoke to her, and without hesitation stretched her hand to greet me. Is it not true, then, that my life, with all its limitations, touches at many points the life of the world beautiful? Everything has its wonders, even darkness and silence, and I learn, whatever state I may be in, therein to be content. 
Sometimes, it is true, a sense of isolation enfolds me like a cold mist as I sit alone and wait at life's shut gate. Beyond there is light and music and sweet companionship, but I may not enter. Fate, silent, pitiless, bars the way. Fain would I question his imperious decree, for my heart is still undisciplined and passionate, but my tongue will not utter the bitter, futile words that rise to my lips, and they fall back into my heart like unshed tears. Silence sits immense upon my soul. Then comes hope with a smile and whispers, There is joy in self-forgetfulness. So I try to make the light in others' eyes my sun, the music in others' ears my symphony, the smile on others' lips my happiness. End of chapter 22《of the story of my life》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of My Life by Helen Keller Chapter 23 Would that I could enrich this sketch with the names of all those who have ministered to my happiness. Some of them would be found written in our literature and dear to the hearts of many, while others would be wholly unknown to most of my readers. But their influence, though it escapes fame, shall live immortal in the lives that have been sweetened and ennobled by it. Those are red-letter days in our lives when we meet people who thrill us like a fine poem, people whose handshake is brimful of unspoken sympathy, and whose sweet, rich natures impart to our eager, impatient spirits a wonderful restfulness which, in its essence, is divine. The perplexities, irritations, and worries that have absorbed us pass like unpleasant dreams, and we wake to see with new eyes and hear with new ears the beauty and harmony of God's real world. The solemn nothings that fill our everyday life blossom suddenly into bright possibilities. In a word, while such friends are near us, we feel that all is well. Perhaps we never saw them before, and they may never cross our life's path again, but the influence of their calm, mellow natures is a libation poured upon our discontent, and we feel its healing touch as the ocean feels the mountain stream freshening its brine. I have often been asked, do not people bore you? I do not understand quite what that means. I suppose the calls of the stupid and curious, especially of newspaper reporters, are always inopportune. I also dislike people who try to talk down to my understanding. They are like people who, when walking with you, try to shorten their steps to suit yours. The hypocrisy in both cases is equally exasperating. The hands of those I meet are dumbly eloquent to me. The touch of some hands is an impertinence. I have met people so empty of joy that when I clasped their frosty fingertips it seemed as if I were shaking hands with a northeast storm. Others there are whose hands have sunbeams in them, so that their grasp warms my heart. It may be only the clinging touch of a child's hand, but there is as much potential sunshine in it for me as there is in a loving glance for others. A hearty handshake or a friendly letter gives me genuine pleasure. I have many far-off friends whom I have never seen. Indeed, they are so many that I have often been unable to reply to their letters. But I wish to say here that I am always grateful for their kind words, however insufficiently I acknowledge them. I count it one of the sweetest privileges of my life to have known and conversed with many men of genius. Only those who knew Bishop Brooks can appreciate the joy his friendship was to those who possessed it. As a child I loved to sit on his knee and clasp his great hand with one of mine, while Miss Sullivan spelled into the other his beautiful words about God and the spiritual world. I heard him with a child's wonder and delight. My spirit could not reach up to his, but he gave me a real sense of joy in life, and I never left him without carrying away a fine thought that grew in beauty and depth of meaning as I grew. Once, when I was puzzled to know why there were so many religions, he said, There is one universal religion, Helen, 
the religion of love. Love your heavenly Father with your whole heart and soul. Love every child of God as much as ever you can, and remember that the possibilities of good are greater than the possibilities of evil, and you have the key to heaven. And his life was a happy illustration of his great truth. In his noble soul, love and widest knowledge were blended with faith that had become insight. He saw God in all that liberates and lifts, in all that humbles, sweetens, and consoles. Bishop Brooks taught me no special creed or dogma, but he impressed upon my mind two great ideas, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, and made me feel that these truths underlie all creeds and forms of worship. God is love, God is our Father, and we are His children. Therefore the darkest clouds will break, and though right be worsted, wrong shall not triumph. I am too happy in this world to think much about the future, except to remember that I have cherished friends awaiting me there in God's beautiful somewhere. In spite of the lapse of years, they seem so close to me that I should not think it strange if at any moment they should clasp my hand and speak words of endearment as they used to before they went away. Since Bishop Brooks died, I have read the Bible through. Also some philosophical works on religion, among them Swedenborg's Heaven and Hell and Drummond's Ascent of Man and I have found no creed or system more soul-satisfying than Bishop Brooks' creed of love. I knew Mr. Henry Drummond, and the memory of his strong, warm handclasp is like a benediction. He was the most sympathetic of companions. He knew so much and was so genial that it was impossible to feel dull in his presence. I remember well the first time I saw Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes. He had invited Miss Sullivan and me to call on him one Sunday afternoon. It was early in the spring, just after I had learned to speak. We were shown at once to his library, where we found him seated in a big armchair by an open fire which glowed and crackled on the hearth, thinking, he said, of other days. And listening to the murmur of the river Charles, I suggested. Yes, he replied, the Charles has many dear associations for me. There was an odour of print and leather in the room which told me that it was full of books, and I stretched out my hand instinctively to find them. My fingers lighted upon a beautiful volume of Tennyson's poems, and when Miss Sullivan told me what it was, I began to recite, Break, break, break on thy cold grey stones, O sea. But I stopped suddenly. I felt tears on my hand. I had made my beloved poet weep, and I was greatly distressed. He made me sit in his armchair, while he brought different interesting things for me to examine, and at his request I recited The Chambered Nautilus, which was then my favourite poem. After that I saw Dr. Holmes many times, and learned to love the man as well as the poet. One beautiful summer day, not long after my meeting with Dr. Holmes, Miss Sullivan and I visited Whittier in his quiet home on the Merrimack. His gentle courtesy and quaint speech won my heart. He had a book of his poems in raised print, from which I read in school days. He was delighted that I could pronounce the words so well, and said that he had no difficulty in understanding me. Then I asked many questions about the poem, and read his answers by placing my fingers on his lips. He said he was the little boy in the poem, and that the girl's name was Sally, and more which I have forgotten. I also recited Laos Dio, and as I spoke the concluding verses, he placed in my hands a statue of a slave, from whose crouching figure the fetters were falling, even as they fell from Peter's limbs when the angel led him forth out of prison. Afterward we went into his study, and he wrote his autograph for my teacher, and expressed his admiration of her work, saying to me, She is thy spiritual liberator. Then he led me to the gate, and kissed me tenderly on my forehead. I promised to visit him again the following summer, but he died before the promise was fulfilled. Dr. Edward Everett Hale is one of my very oldest friends. I have known him since I was eight, and my love for him has increased with my years. 
His wise, tender sympathy has been the support of Miss Sullivan and me in times of trial and sorrow, and his strong hand has helped us over many rough places. And what he has done for us, he has done for thousands of those who have difficult tasks to accomplish. He has filled the old skins of dogma with the new wine of love, and shown men what it is to believe, live, and be free. What he has taught we have seen beautifully expressed in his own life, love of country, kindness to the least of his brethren, and a sincere desire to live upward and onward. He has been a prophet and an inspirer of men, and a mighty doer of the word, the friend of all his race. God bless him. I have already written of my first meeting with Dr. Alexander Graham Bell. Since then I have spent many happy days with him at Washington and at his beautiful home in the heart of Cape Breton Island, near Baddock, the village made famous by Charles Dudley Warner's book. Here, in Dr. Bell's laboratory, or in the fields on the shore of the great brass door, I have spent many delightful hours listening to what he had to tell me about his experiments, and helping him fly kites by means of which he expected to discover the laws that shall govern the future airship. Dr. Bell is proficient in many fields of science, and has the art of making every subject he touches interesting, even the most abstruse theories. He makes you feel that if you only had a little more time, you too might be an inventor. He has a humorous and poetic side too. His dominating passion is his love for children. He is never quite so happy as when he has a little deaf child in his arms. His labours in behalf of the deaf will live on and bless generations of children yet to come, and we love him alike for what he himself has achieved and for what he has evoked from others. During the two years I spent in New York I had many opportunities to talk with distinguished people whose names I had often heard, but whom I had never expected to meet. Most of them I met first in the house of my good friend Mr. Lawrence Hutton. It was a great privilege to visit him and dear Mrs. Hutton in their lovely home, and see their library, and read the beautiful sentiments and bright thoughts gifted friends had written for them. It has been truly said that Mr. Hutton has the faculty of bringing out in everyone the best thoughts and kindest sentiments. One does not need to read A Boy I Knew to understand him. The most generous, sweet-natured boy I ever knew, a good friend in all sorts of weather, who traces the footprints of love in the life of dogs as well as in that of his fellow men. Mrs. Hutton is a true and tried friend. Much that I hold sweetest, much that I hold most precious, I owe to her. She has oftenest advised and helped me in my progress through college. When I find my work particularly difficult and discouraging, she writes me letters that make me feel glad and brave, for she is one of those from whom we learn that one painful duty fulfilled makes the next plainer and easier. Mr. Hutton introduced me to many of his literary friends, greatest of whom are Mr. William Dean Howells and Mark Twain. I also met Mr. Richard Watson Gilder and Mr. Edmund Clarence Stedman. I also knew Mr. Charles Dudley Warner, the most delightful of storytellers and the most beloved friend, whose sympathy was so broad that it may be truly said of him he loved all living things and his neighbour as himself. Once Mr. Warner brought to see me the dear poet of the woodlands, Mr. John Burroughs. They were all gentle and sympathetic, and I felt the charm of their manner as much as I had felt the brilliancy of their essays and poems. I could not keep pace with all these literary folk as they glanced from subject to subject and entered into deep dispute, or made conversation sparkle with epigrams and happy witticisms. I was like little Ascanius, who followed with unequal steps the heroic strides of Aeneas on his march toward mighty destinies. But they spoke many gracious words to me. Mr. Gilder told me about his moonlight journeys across the vast desert to the pyramids, and in a letter he wrote me he made his mark under his signature deep in the paper so that I could feel it. This reminds me that Dr. Hale used to give a personal touch to his letters to me by pricking his signature in Braille. I read from Mark Twain's lips one or two of his good stories. 
He has his own way of thinking, saying, and doing everything. I feel the twinkle of his eye in his handshake, even while he utters his cynical wisdom in an indescribably drawl voice, he makes you feel that his heart is a tender Iliad of human sympathy. There are a host of other interesting people I met in New York, Mrs. Mary Mapes Dodge, the beloved editor of St. Nicholas, and Mrs. Riggs, Kate Douglas Wiggin, the sweet author of Patsy. I received from them gifts that have the gentle concurrence of the heart, books containing their own thoughts, soul-illumined letters, and photographs that I love to have described again and again. But there is not space to mention all my friends, and indeed there are things about them hidden behind the wings of cherubim, things too sacred to set forth in cold print. It is with hesitancy that I have spoken even of Mrs. Lawrence Hutton. I shall mention only two other friends. One is Mrs. William Thaw, of Pittsburgh, whom I have often visited in her home, Lyndhurst. She is always doing something to make someone happy, and her generosity and wise counsel have never failed my teacher and me in all the years we have known her. To the other friend I am also deeply indebted. He is well known for the powerful hand with which he guides vast enterprises, and his wonderful abilities have gained for him the respect of all. Kind to everyone, he goes about doing good, silent and unseen. Again, and touch upon the circle of honoured names I must not mention, but I would fain acknowledge his generosity and affectionate interest which make it possible for me to go to college. Thus it is that my friends have made the story of my life. In a thousand ways they have turned my limitations into beautiful privileges, and enabled me to walk serene and happy in the shadow cast by my deprivation. End of chapter 23 End of the story of my life by Helen Keller